All right. Okay. We're on. Yep, we're live. Hello, everyone. I don't know how many people are on, but hello. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll just give everyone a few minutes. Do you wanna? Do you wanna go ahead, Andy? Yeah, I was just gonna. I just just wait for a few moment, few more minutes for people to turn up and then see. Yeah, and then we'll do an intro. Um, cool. Sounds good. Uh, feel free to say hello if anybody's uh, watching. Uh, crab emojis as well. We do love our crab emojis. <laughs> we do, we we really do. <laughs> Just go, I'll go have a quick look. Yeah, I've had one of those days where uh like just before I came on the stream, I my, my Bluetooth keyboard decided it wasn't connecting to Bluetooth. That's the kind of day I'm having. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a fun day. Yeah. <laughs> hi Johnny, hi Eunice. Uh Sean from San, San Roman, California. Ooh, right, excellent. Hopefully, it's not the wrong Manchester you thought uh, local. Oh, yeah. Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we, we, we're very happy to have people from from anywhere come watch. It's uh, you're very welcome. That's one of the exciting things really about these digital meetups, isn't it? That you're not really restricted to your home city in quite the same way as usual. Yep, exactly. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I think I think that really is one of the yeah, the best things about it. Um, yeah. Like, I, I I miss seeing people face to face, really. But then I also do like being like, oh, this one sounds interesting, and it's in Munich, but I can just watch it anyway. You know, um, swings and roundabouts definitely. Um, I imagine next year there's going to be a big leveling where meetups like us have to be like, we'll do in person and online and somehow make that work. So we'll figure it out, I think. The price of video cameras is going to shoot through the roof. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Hi, Mario from Mexico. Ah, yeah. Excellent. Really are going global. That's amazing. Uh, we're just giving in a few more minutes uh, for, for people to start. We should we'll start about five uh, five past. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah, the numbers are still going up on the watching list. So, have you got any any spiel from Arm, Jamie? Do they want you to say that? I don't know. They're they're selling. They're not selling processes. They're selling designs for processes. But you know, anything like that. Uh, no, it's not much. Just. They sponsored it, so thanks them for that. Uh, the QR code for the careers page, if you're interested, there's some roles on there, but don't be too many at the minute. Remember to silence all devices. That was the mistake I made last time. <laughs> yeah. Things start ringing. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll be slamming that mute button as soon as possible. Um, yeah. 14 cool. watching now yeah should we give it i think one more minute and then make yeah, a move yeah. on to the talk yeah. okay i hope you're ready david um, <laughs> as ready as i will be yeah exactly now no pressure but this has a global audience so um <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've taken my opening joke away from me now <laughs> yeah oh, apologies sorry 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not not trying to do that intentionally, honestly. Oh no, that's all right. <laughs> do you think that's enough? We're good to go. Yeah, should we start getting? Do you want to get your slides up, David? And then I think we got like thirty seconds till five past seven, so it probably gives us time to shuffle them round, and then we'll be good. Oh, one thing to say um, for everyone in the chat and who's watching: if you want to ask questions, just please ask them sort of during while things are going on. Uh, and then at the end, we can kind of scroll through them and select them and bring them up. So if you think of a question, just, uh, yeah, just pop it in the chat and we'll we'll, we'll sift through them and, and try and bring them up as we get to the end. This is probably a good moment to double check. I haven't got the uh, YouTube chat open, so I can't actually see what anyone's asking right now. That's fine, right? Yeah, there, there, there should be like a comments tab at the other side in the interface. Oh, uh, right. I think ah, shows you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, those two like tabs. So, 
it's all good. Brilliant. I can now see what everyone said so far. Mm -hmm. Hello to everybody. Cool. Yep. Should we swap the slides? Should we go for yep. David's? Yes. So, whenever you're ready, David, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess in that case, let's get going. Um, well, I'm here today to give you my talk titled Speeding Up the Snake. Um, I think maybe a better description of what actually I'm going to talk about is extending Python using Rust code. Uh, thank you very much to the Rust Manchester organizers for inviting me to do this talk. It's a project actually uh, that I've been quite involved in as a hobby the last couple of years. So it's really exciting to share it with you all. And thank you to you guys in the audience who've come from I was expecting maybe a more domestic audience, but you come from across the globe. So whether it's your morning, evening, afternoon, thank you for spending your time here today. Um, what this talk's gonna contain, I'm gonna start with just telling you a little bit about myself and how I've come to this point where I'm now talking to you about extending Python with Rust. I'm going to give you a bit more context on why I think it's a particularly interesting pairing of languages, and also then give you an introduction to an open source Rust library called PyO3 which is a project that I'm personally quite actively uh, contributing to at the moment to bring these two languages closer together. Uh, I want to also convince you today how you can get started using PyO3 yourself. Uh, hopefully a takeaway that you'll have from this talk is that it's actually quite easy to begin using this library. And so I'm going to give you a bit of a demonstration. And then finally, I hope there should be time for a bit of wrap up and Q&A at the end. So about me, well, um, I started as many computer scientists do, actually not doing computer science at all. I studied physics many, many years ago, but I was also always tinkering with computers and websites and whatnot through student societies or hobbies or games or whatever kind of thing was interesting me across the time. So in 2012, I actually got my first taste of Python. It was a summer contract building a website uh, using the web framework Django. 2014, I graduated, got my first software job, again, using Python. I was in a data science team at the time, and we did lots of bits and pieces. One of the things we did is uh, wrote simulations for uh, in video games in particular that this data science team was working on. And these simulations were fully py written in Python. And I did experience, at the time, performance challenges that made me wonder about like how can you make Python run faster? 2015, I found a language called Rust. It was uh, a great time, it, you know, it was Rust 1.2. I was very excited to discover this language. It, I found it both fast, but also nice to work with. Um, I was also really taken by the community, the open source, both culture and I guess openness with which Rust is developed. And so I really felt inspired to want to be a part of that community. 2016, I dared to make my first open source contribution to Rust. I picked a task in the uh, standard library which implemented a conversion between two data structures. And I have many thanks for the two reviewers that you know took on basically a Rust newbie still PR and uh, actually coaxed it into the Rust standard library. That was very cool and very satisfying. In 2017, 2018, back in my professional career, I ended up working on a large project with a lot of uh, packages that were Python packages using Python 2 backed by C++ for performance and migrating this whole enormous bundle of packages to Python 3. It was a project that took a couple of years to complete, and it really gave me over the time quite a lot of knowledge about how to do this, like implementing native extensions to Python and really the workings of the Python interpreter at the same time. And so it's not much of a surprise that then a year later, I finally found my home in the Rust open source ecosystem contributing to PyO3. And I've been working on PyO3 ever since. As of yesterday, uh, I actually noticed that I, I've now hit the joint most equal for a number of commits ever contributed to the PyO3 code base. So, uh, and I continue to keep going well into the future. So hopefully there'll be much more that I can offer to this community. I'd also like to take a moment to thank my employer, Reinfer. Um, they're a really fantastic employer. I, they've given me the time that I needed to prepare this talk and uh, also given me the chance to just explore, rehearse it with them. I uh, work on this uh, backend platform for a machine learning service, which we build, which enables people to uh, basically train conversation data and then 
use that to label further conversations without even having to have specialist domain knowledge. So we create the interface to make it easy to train things and also then give you feedback on what you need to do to improve your machine learning model. And our backend's written in a mixture of Rust and Python. It's no surprise that we use PyO3 to do part of this. So I'm really fortunate to be working at a workplace where I'm actually uh, fully including my hobby in my day job. Uh, we have our website, the link for it is at the bottom of the slide. And if you're interested in working with conversation data for what you do, I'd fully advise you to check us out. We have a way that you can sign up for a trial so you can experiment with our system for yourselves. Okay, so let's move on to the actual content of the talk now that you've finished hearing about me. Why should we talk about Python and Rust together? Well, in my opinion, Python and Rust are going to be both key participants in the software stacks of the future. And the reason I think this is because, as far as I can tell, developers really love working in these two languages. Uh, this is the Stack Overflow Survey 2021, and it's measuring for users who are currently working in a given programming language, what's the percentage of them that would like to continue working in that programming language versus the percentage of those who really don't want to work in that programming language anymore. And this is now, I think, the sixth year in a row that Rust has come out at the top of this chart. Rust may be a relatively young language compared to many of the, many of the other technologies in this graph, but it's had such overwhelming support that I think it really signals that there's a strong future ahead of Rust. And similarly, we see Python coming in at number six on this chart. But I don't think we also need to read too much into that because Python is already an enormous, enormous language that's been around for decades. And so that's just a signal that Python's going to be with us for many decades more. That signal gets even stronger if we look at of the programming or programmers who currently don't use a programming language, how many of them want to take up that programming language. So of those who don't use Python, almost 20% of them want to be using Python. And similarly, of those who don't currently use Rust, which is probably a much, much, much larger number of programmers, there's a 14% of those that want to use Rust. That's in position number five on this particular chart. So I see both of these two languages as continuing to exist long, long into the future in our software stack. But what makes these two languages particularly well suited for each other? So let's explore that by looking at each of these two languages in turn. First, why Python? Well, it's a scripting language, which makes it very fast to just like try things out. You can iterate really quickly with Python. And it's also got this interactive mode so that you can quite literally type out Python instructions and see what happens. And this is brilliant for debugging. It also makes it really easy for beginner programmers to like try programming for the first time. They can just begin typing a few commands and see what happens. They don't quite have to get to grips with the idea of writing a whole program and then seeing it run from start to finish. There's also a really strong package and standard library ecosystem for Python, which means that you can actually be empowered to do a great many things with this language. And for example, this has led to it becoming, like, I think I would say dominant in machine learning and the AI research space, but there's many, many other spaces where Python is a huge, huge language that's very, very present. What's Python not so great at? Well, it suffers a bit from performance constraints and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, it's probably also not very good for web front end development. I think you can get Python to run on the web, but I wouldn't personally advise it. Your languages like JavaScript are obviously built natively for the browser, and that's really what you want to be doing web front end development in. How about Rust? Well, Rust gives you and converts excellent, excellent performance. It really gives you the chance to, where you need to, get right down towards the computer's hardware in a way that you just absolutely cannot do with Python. So you can really eke out that last drop. At the same time, you get, I would say, excellent modern de developer ergonomics that mean you can do really high level kind of programming that's much more akin to the sort of algorithm writing you might do with Python in Rust as well. And it's designed really to write correct code, I would say. That I, I would argue that if you write some code in Rust and deploy it to production, you can have reasonable confidence that what you've written is going to be reliable. And that's a really strong asset in a language. In addition, it also has a really good tooling and package ecosystem, very similar to Python. 
Sure, Rust is arguably a lot younger than Python, so that package ecosystem may not quite be as rich yet, but it's growing so quickly year on year. And I think the progress of packages, I mean, I can obviously talk about Py3's own progress, but we can see things like the Rust async story has really grown and grown and grown recently too. Rust is also maybe a bit harder to learn for beginner programmers, and it might take a bit longer to actually iterate on your program. But I think this is all part of the compiler's promise to make you write correct code. It's really nursing you to do something that will end up being right. And so part of that steep learning curve and working a bit slower is just essentially the compiler really nudging you in the right direction. And once you understand what the compiler is nudging you to do, it can be a really, really productive language to work with. I think it's also fair to say that Rust is probably not yet the language of choice for web front-end development. Um, there's obviously WebAssembly, which is an emergent technology allowing you to potentially write uh, web front-end in production in Rust in the future, but I personally feel that it's not quite time for you to be trying this yet. So if you maybe came along to do web front-end development, this talk's probably not yet offering something for you. So. We spoke about Python's performance constraints and then that Rust has excellent performance characteristics. So what is it about Python in particular that means it might need to partner with something like Rust? Well, it's an interpreted language. And this means that when you're running your Python code, quite literally, there is a program, the Python interpreter, which is reading in your code, figuring out what to do with it, and then turning this into like appropriate actions that are defined by the programming languages spec. And so there's this constant overhead that's basically the difference between your Rust code running completely on your CPU's hardware versus the Python code, which runs on essentially a Python bytecode, which has had to be passed by your interpreter. It's also dynamically typed. And this means that when you try and do things in Python, the type Python interpreter is also having to figure out exactly what you asked for. So if you write, uh, say, x plus y in Python, then the Python interpreter actually has to figure out what is x? Is it a string? Is it an integer? Is, is y a string or an integer? And then different things will happen depending on what these two quantities are. And there are rules with how the Python interpreter goes about doing this. But at the same time, this does add an overhead that slows down the language. And compiled languages like Rust that are also statically typed just don't have these two overheads. Finally, there's this notion in Python of what's called the global interpreter lock. And this is necessary to make the Python interpreter itself safe to use in like concurrent programming environments. So what the global interpreter lock does is it means that only a single Python thread can really be running on your hardware at any one time. And this is yeah necessary for correctness, but it has the downside that if you try and write multi-threaded code in Python, you're really ever only going to get full advantage of one of your CPU cores whereas modern PCs often have, say, six, eight, or even many, as many as 16 CPUs. So there's a lot of your computer that's not leveraged by using Python. Solutions to these problems exist. There's, for example, alternative Python interpreters, such as PyPy, which is a, a JIT-optimized interpreter. So as it's running your Python code, it's going to try and figure out what the best machine code is to represent that function that you've written. And so it's going to eventually iron out the overheads that you'd associate with the interpreted language, which is, has dynamic typing. However, it's still got that like warm up period associated with figuring out what that optimized code is in the first place. And also, PyPy tends to lag a little bit behind the official Python implementation. Say we're now on Python 3.9 and approaching Python 3.10. And PyPy is currently supporting Python 3.7 and approaching Python 3.8. So for many cases, PyPy can be a great drop-in solution, but it still doesn't free you from the global interpreter lock, and it's got these other constraints as well. Alternatively, you can go down routes of compiling your Python code. And there's two very popular projects for this. One is Cython, um, which is essentially introducing a slightly C-like syntax on top of your existing Python syntax or MyPyC, which uses the Python's own typing syntax, and then you can compile that down to native code. And this can remove a lot of the interpreter costs. There's still perhaps sometimes costs associated with dynamic typing. It depends really with what uh, Cython and MyPyC have been able to do. Um, this kind of approach is used by projects such as Pandas in Cython's case, or MyPy itself is implemented in MyPyC, if you're looking at that one. 
Also, there's a choice of just writing a C or C++ extension module. And what this is, is a library that Python can then import from and run essentially C or C++ code as if it were Python code. And this is also the approach that we're going to take when talking about PyO3 in a moment. Uh, projects such as uh, NumPy are very well known, or TensorFlow for the C++ case are examples of existing Python projects that do this. So it's time to move on with that kind of overhead of the two languages to PyO3. The vision that I've got for PyO3 has kind of already been described a little bit before, but let's repeat it again. There's a lot of good reasons that you'd want to write Python code. And here I've just drawn a, a very crude diagram with four files, Python files a, b, c, and d dot py. And the vision really should be that you can replace one of these files with something else, but continue to use it from the other files as if nothing had changed. And to really, you really, the motivation for doing this in my eyes is to get something that's faster than Python. And I believe that Rust can be a really convenient and easy way to do this. We've obviously seen that there are many existing approaches. Um, I still think that it's worth throwing Rust into the mix. And how does Py3 actually go about achieving this? Well, it's a project that allows you to either embed Rust code inside Python or Python code inside Rust. Uh, we're going to focus entirely on the Rust code inside Python case, uh, as which is what we've been speaking about so far. The Python inside Rust case might be the sort of thing you were doing if you were writing a game engine in Rust and you wanted to provide the ability for some of your game designers to script just pieces of the game levels, for example. So that's possible using Py03, but it's not really what we're talking about today. Py03 as a project has uh, had a nicely steadily climbing GitHub star history since it was published in 2017. Um, it's really pleasing to see this number continue to grow. And it looks like it might be getting just very slightly faster. I imagine that's mostly due to the effect of the Rust community growing and growing rather than Py03 itself. But who knows where we'll be in the future. We're currently at about 15,000 downloads a day and coming up to 3 million downloads over all time. And that's an amazing statistic that I'm super proud of. But at the same time, I don't think it quite covers all of Py03's reach, because especially in this case of Python code embedding Rust code, then sure, we can have Py03 downloaded once and compiled into a Python package, which then could be downloaded many, many, many times over. So the true number of Python software users out there who are using software written in PyO3, I don't have a good handle on, but I think it's even higher than that 3 million stat. It's really amazing. Um, and finally, we also try our best to make it accessible for everyone to get started with PyO3. So there's a developer guide. You can go to pyo3.rs and get an introduction to how to start working with PyO3. And there's also our readme at the front of our GitHub repository. So please feel free to go check those out at your convenience. And time to poke a little bit under the hood before we get started with actually looking at how to use PyO3. So here we've got the Python import statement. And what this import statement will do is it will go and look for a Python file called b.py. It will read the contents of that b.py file to paying some of our interpreter overheads and then make the contents of that B file available under the namespace B for future Python code to use. However, it doesn't have to be a Python file. This import statement, if it doesn't find a Python file, can also look for extension modules from a compiled native library. So if you're running on Mac or Linux, it might be called B.so. On Windows, it might be called B.pyd. But the idea is that this is something that the Python interpreter deliberately supports and has publicly had support for for many, 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 many years, and it's very widely used. So Cython, C, C++, all these technologies that I named that are already out there and very popular, all use this technique, and so does PyO3. And how does PyO3 actually get you that native library? Well, we use these things called procedural macros for the bulk of the work, and they're a Rust language feature that allow you to generate Rust code from other more normal looking Rust code. So it can automate either the hard tasks or the tasks which are just very repetitive or boilerplatey that the programmer doesn't need to do. 
In our case, it's a mixture of a bit of both. So here we have a Rust function that's just called my Rust function. I haven't bothered giving it any arguments, and I've just put ellipses for the function body. But the interesting bit is that we've got this proc macro over the top py function, and this is published by the py03 crate. And what it's going to do is actually generate the Rust code needed to create the C extension modules, I guess, classes and objects that will eventually define what the Python functions look like when imp imported from the C extension module. We've got tools in the py 3 project called Maturin and Setup Tools Rust, depending on exactly how you like to do this, um, to basically handle that task of compiling this code down so that you can put it into your Python environment and start using it. And I'm going to be using in the live demonstration a bit later Maturin, but we've got examples in the py 3 repository for both Maturin and Setup Tools Rust so that you can understand the differences and see how to get started with both. And now let's move on to a little simple example of using py 3 So let's imagine that a member of your team has written a Python algorithm that is just too, slightly a bottleneck in your overall software stack. Um, here we've got an algorithm that's going to count the occurrences of some needle, uh, which is a string, in some body of text called contents, which is also a string. And it's going to return that quantity as an integer. So if we imagine the input contents might be, for example, this excerpt of the Zen of Python. And then the algorithm is going to read through each line of the excerpt in turn, look at each word within that line, and then compare whether that word is equivalent to our needle. Maybe our needle is also is. If that's the case, then it's going to increment the total and once it's consumed the whole input, it's going to return that total. Well, using py 3 your colleague might end up rewriting that same function in Rust. And I just want you to take a moment to look here at how incredibly similar I think these two functions are. They're both very much, there's a keyword to start the function definition, the name is the same, we have parentheses, the arguments and type annotations are very similarly structured. Sure, in Rust, we've got ampersand stir, and usize as the return type for very slight ty technical typing reasons that I don't want to get into in this talk. We then have the keyword to declare the total, and then we iterate over the lines, we split the line up, and then we compare an increment if needed, finally returning the total. And we've got our pi function annotation on the top because that's what pi3 is going to take to generate this into something which can be read from Python. The really cool thing is that doing this quite literal translation as, sim as straightforward as you can between Python and Rust, you're going to get something that's about three times faster when you then start running it. And I kind of consider this, maybe you have to do a little bit of time to do this translation, but it's really pretty much for free. But I don't think you have to take just my word for it. Let's go on and actually do this in practice. So please bear with while I figure out how to tab into my editor. Here we are. So um, here we have prepared ahead of time that same Python snippet, which we just saw in the presentation. And I've got beneath me a terminal where we can go ahead and run this. So I'll start by creating a new Python virtual environment. I don't really want to talk in this topic about what Python virtual environments are, but suffice to say they are isolated collections of packages so that we can run our software without having uh, worries about it interacting with other Python software we've got installed. Skip so the Python package manager to check what software I have in this new virtual environment. We can see I get nothing back. What I am going to do is I'm going to immediately install IPython though which is an interactive environment that's slightly nicer than the Python standard read in Val print, just so that we can have a bit of a clearer input. So here we go. Now we've got IPython. We can import this file. And actually, I have prepared beneath that function this uh, text, which is the full excerpt of the Zen of Python, and I've multiplied it through a thousand times just to produce a nice large input. So let's actually go ahead and import that as well. Once we do that, we can just run this thing. 
so with the original needle that suggested is, we find because it's multiplied through 10,000 or 1,000 times, it's not really a surprise that we get 10,000 as our output. Uh, we could change this to something different, and we'll see that we'll get a different count. It's still always going to be a multiple of 1,000 regardless of what we pick. Maybe ABC doesn't actually exist in the Z of Python as a word, so there we go, we get zero. I, I'm going to stop there and close out of this and now try and do the same thing in Rust. So how do we do that? First off, we're going to use a package, uh, the packaging tool for Rust called Cargo to create ourselves a new library. If I can get the syntax of the command right. So there we go. And I'm just going to add this folder uh, to the workspace so that we can actually have Rust Analyzer giving us some good syntax highlighting. I will need to load up the Python virtual environment again. And now we can go into that folder. Let's take a look now at what Cargo new generated for us. So we have a cargo.toml file here. It's currently blank. It's just saying that our package is called sample rs, which I gave it the name, and there's currently no dependencies yet. I'm going to go ahead and add pyo3, and I'm going to do this in the way that you will see if you look on the pyo3 uh, readme. And this is because we need to activate the extension module feature, which tells the pyo3 build system that we're going to be doing this Rust embedding Python case and thus sets up the overall package that gets computed to do that, to be correct and importable from Python. And we also need to set the crate type for the library to be a C dialib, which is again a C dynamic library, which is what we need for this C extension module that Python's going to be importing. And the contents of our library at the moment, there's not much interesting in it. It's just the test uh, which Cargo has put, put for us as a sort of example of how to get started with building a library. We're not going to worry about that for the moment. Instead, what we're going to do is start trying to compile and run this. So I'm going to install our tool Maturin, which I mentioned earlier. And this is a command line tool that we can use to start interacting with our Rust library. So if I use this command Maturin develop, it's going to wait, go away and compile this library that we've started building and make it so that we can begin importing it from Python. Now, Maturin has helpfully told us that it couldn't find the symbol to, or this pi in sample rs, which is what the Python C extension module should offer for Python to be able to import it. It's telling you that it will fail to import this and warning us that we need to check our pi module. Actually, it's a bit more simple than that. We just haven't put our Pi module into this file yet. And what does that mean? Well, Pi module is one of those procedural macros which I spoke about to generate some extension module code. So let's go ahead and do this. We need to import the Pi03 prelude first, which contains a number of these procedural macros which are most common for doing this work. And now we can write our Pi module, which is structured at the moment using Pi03's current syntax as a, a function, which takes uh, first off the Python token. I don't really want to get too much into that. It's essentially just telling it, uh, saying that we have the global interpreter lock currently held, so it's safe for us to do Python operations on this thread. And also the Py module that we're going to be filling in with the contents of our actual implementation. And this is going to return a Py result. If you've worked with Rust before, you will know that the result types are used to communicate that errors occurred in Rust. And in particular, in Py3, the Py result is used to con uh, convey that an error that's appropriate for Python occurred. And so in Py3 speak, if you return an error as through a Py result, then it's going to turn into a Python exception later. We're not really going to deal with exceptions in this talk. I just want to focus on showing a few sample, simple examples. So we need to have a tail return for this fallible function that's just OK. And there's still nothing in this module. So I'm just going to jump over and, for the sake of time, copy out from my notes 
the original function which we saw in our slides. So here we've got our pi function that counts the occurrences, yada, 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 yada. To add this to the pi module, we can use the API m.add function, and we have to use a macro to help us collect the right information from the procedural macro above. If you look into the Pi3 user guide, this is all explained in a little bit more detail. Uh, unfortunately, Rust Analyzer put some squigglies underneath this wrap Pi function execution, and that's known. Uh, it's because of the way that this macro currently works, but I hope to resolve that in Pi03 0.40 or 0.15, perhaps. It, so this all works fine. Don't worry about the squigglies. They're a little bit annoying, but all is well. We can now switch over back to Maturin and run mature and develop again. And this time it's happy. To make my life easier, I'm also going to copy that sample pi folder into here so that I have it available for importing as well. So now let's bring up IPython and start playing with our compiled extension module. So we can now do from sample rs import count occurrences. And that's just that. We've managed to pull that through. Let's also import uh, from Python 1. We'll import count occurrences pi and the text. Oh, of course, it's called count occurrences, and we're going to rename the import. Brilliant. So that's all imported. What we can do now, let's just verify that they give the same outputs. So count occurrences with the text and is should give us that same 10,000 that we saw from running it with count occurrences pi. And we could do something else. We, got, we ran better before, didn't we? And we got 8,000 out. So I'm happy to say that these implementations are equivalent. And we read and already know that. Now, the interesting bit is let's time it. So we can do this. And let's start with the Python option. And on my computer, it's going to come out. But the Python implementation takes, let's wait for it, 8.8 .8 milliseconds. And so this is obviously going to be a bit variable depending on what I've got running. I've currently got my screen sharing and stuff. I'm sure it's going to be increasing the load. But there you go, 8.8 .8 milliseconds is what we've recorded right now. If we switch over to the Rust implementation and run the same instruction, it reckons that we've got 37 milliseconds. I thought I was telling you that Rust runs faster, but wait. So there's something I need to explain here. Rust, when compiling, has basically two modes that you can compile in. First off, there's the debug mode, which is quick to compile, but doesn't bother doing a lot of optimizations, which make Rust ultimately the fast language it is. And we didn't say that we wanted to do anything particular, so it has compiled for us in debug mode. That's normally what you want when you're developing, because you want to be able to have these quick iterations and compilation. However, Rust has an alternative mode called release mode. And in release mode, instead, a lot of optimizations are applied that makes it very fast. But this takes a bit longer, so it's not typically what you want to do when developing. If we add the release flag to mature and develop and run this again, we're instead going to compile our library in release mode. And then hopefully we should get a fairer performance comparison between what Python can do and what Rust can actually do. And so let's go again with IPython. So this time we can. Here's the Python one. Again, we should get a very similar result to last time. OK, nine milliseconds this time. It's pretty close. And the Rust one has come in at three milliseconds. So that's pretty much more or less bang on that three times faster speed up that I promised that we were going to get. And to me, this is really, really cool. We've been able to write not that much Rust code and replace an algorithm which was written in Python with an algorithm that's equivalent and turns out running three times as fast. 
uh, that could be done 10 minutes of work, especially if you're familiar with, you know, the, the kinds of types and changes that you need to make to translate some Python code to Rust code. And it, it could get better than this. We spoke about the global interpreter lock and how Python's locked to a single thread of execution. Our Rust code is also single threaded at the moment, but you could, using other packages in the Rust ecosystem, such as Rayon, turn this into a multi-threaded function so that you could really race through the input. And uh, I haven't bothered doing it in this talk. I'm actually going to show you something slightly different next. But if you check out the word count example on the Py3 repository, you'll, say, you'll find a function that looks curiously similar to what I've just shown you now. And it demonstrates how to make this multi-threaded. And what you can find is you can maybe approach on like most modern computers, perhaps a 10x speed up of the Python code compared when you run it through some Rust code. And using Rayon, it's actually surprisingly easy to add this multi-threading. So it's really not a gigantic cognitive leap from what we've already done. And that's really quite something. Let's now go on then to what I also wanted to show you, which is I'd like to talk about Python classes. And I think they're also like a, a key part of how you might write Python code. And I want to show you how it looks to write a Python class from Rust. So beneath all of this other stuff, here we've got an import just in our sample Py file that is saying from data classes, import data class. And then we're going to create this data class called point2d, which has just got two coordinates, x and y, which are floating point numbers. And this is deliberately a very simple minimal class, but what this data class annotation is going to do, it's going to mean that we get a constructor defined. It's going to mean we get a representation so that it looks nice when we try and print it out to the terminal. And it's also, because I've set the order equals true parameter, going to generate ordering for this. So we could ask to sort these points. And let's try and build some equivalent functionality from Rust. I think I'm just checking the time. It looks like we're still very much on track to fit this in. So I will proceed. Right, so here we are back in our Rust code. And we can use instead the PyClass macro to do this in conjunction with the Rust syntax for a class which we call a struct in Rust, which will look like this. The numbers are represented either as 32-bit or 64-bit floating point numbers. We're going to use 64-bit because it's extra precision and it doesn't really make a huge performance difference for this particular use case. So here we have our two numbers, x and y. And we can go ahead and add this to our module using the add class interface. And we're now ready to run it. Python, or Rust, the Rust compiler has given us some warnings that we're not actually accessing these two variables, x and y, but that's OK. We can worry about that later. Let's go ahead and play with this in, in IPython. So from sample RS, we can import our point dd type. And let's try and construct one. Type error, no constructor defined. OK, that's because we haven't yet actually taught Py3 how we want to be able to create these things. I, I spoke about how in the Python file, let's actually go ahead and import that. Uh, we had that data class macro defining a whole of decorator, sorry, defining a whole load of things for us. And if I show you that now, the kind of net result of what we're aiming for is something like this. So we can construct one. We can have a look at it. We can also access its individual variables. We can reassign these. And uh, we could also compare them. So if we do this, for example, we might get false. But if we reverse the comparison, we should get true. Right. So this has all been generated for us mostly by the data class. Let's go ahead and make some equivalent setup in our Rust code. So it's a little bit more verbose at the moment in Py3, but I hope that we can maybe improve that over time. Well, what are we aiming for? First off, we're going to need the Py methods procedural macro. And what this does is if we're writing normal Rust methods on a structure, if we add this 
Py methods annotation, then these methods can get made available to Python. And in particular, if we also use the new marker on top of a fun new, which is the standard way of constructing new things in Rust, then we can make that define the constructor that Python will use to generate these types as well. So we'll take the two arguments, the floating point numbers, and we'll create a new point 2D from this. And the implementation is very simple. We can just write this to produce our new floating point numbers. I'm also going to annotate these two uh, variables themselves with the pyo3 get set annotation. And what this is telling pyo3 to do is make these two variables accessible from Python, and they're both read and write. We could also do subsets of this, so this would be a read-only variable, or we could have write-only by making it set and not get. But we've shown that we want read-write here beneath, so let's do that. At this point, we could do these kinds of operations like read our type, write our value. We can also construct these things, but we can't yet do this sorting. And if we were to print p, we'll get something that looks a bit janky out. So let's go ahead and actually just demonstrate that quickly. So with this thing imported, we can now write p equals 0.2d. And this time, if we fill in some arguments, it's going to go through correctly. And as I said, the representation of p, it currently gives you this bit more janky location in memory rather than the nice one that we saw from the data class. Uh, scrolling up in the terminal doesn't seem to have found what I want very easily, so I won't bother doing that. Um, yeah, and in addition, if we try to compare the two order of these things, we haven't yet told Python how we'd like that to work, so we'll get a type error saying that that's not supported. So there's one final procedural macro, which I'm going to introduce to you in our Rust code, and this is the pyproto macro. This is used to implement some special methods which uh, have got built-in meaning in Python, such as how to order, order two types or how to display its representation. And it's really a technical artifact of history that we have the PyProto macro separated from Py methods. I actually hope that maybe for Py 0.15 or an upcoming release soon, that we can do away with PyProto and write all of these special methods directly in the Py methods block that we've already written here. However, we're going to have to have this PyProto method uh, for now. So here we can do an implementation of what we've called the Py object protocol uh, for our point d type. And we're going to need two functions. First off, we're going to need our wrapper, which if you're familiar with Python magic methods, this is the one that defines the formatting when we type just p like this. And so it's a function that takes self, which in Rust speak means that it's going to take a point 2D type and so self is a reference to a point 2D. And we're going to output uh, the string that we'd like to produce. So we saw what the Python output was, and I think it looked like this. So here we have a usage of Rust's format macro, which is used to create new strings while filling in placeholders. And the two placeholders that we're filling in are the X and Y values of this type. And then finally, the other function we need to implement is the rich comparison. I, I'm just going to copy this in from my notes because it's a bit boilerplate-y. Uh, there's definitely room to improve this in Pyo3's interface. But for, suffice to summarize, this is a function that takes self plus some other point. Uh, Python will also tell us the comparison operator that's been used, whether it's, say, a less than, an equal, a less than or equal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're going to use Rust's comparison mechanism to decide what the ordering of these two types are. And this is a nice example of where Rust enforces correctness. So that in Rust, there's a the notion of full ordering and partial ordering. And floats are partially ordered because NANs exist. And NAN doesn't have a well-defined order in floats and point arithmetic. Like one less than NAN or one greater than NAN, neither are particularly mean meaningful operations. And similarly, comparing NAN with itself also isn't a meaningful operation. So here, the solution I've had is that if we get this NAN result, so the partial comparison failed, then I'm just going to raise a value error saying that we can't sort a NAN. 
And this is a bit different to our Python implementation, where I think it will happily, happily ignore NANs and do something that Python's decided is appropriate with them. I'd need to verify that. We can perhaps do that in a second in the terminal. But once we've gotten our ordering out, we can use the op and the ordering to decide what the result should be. I think I'm going to need to import just a few of these quickly to satisfy these type constraints. And also give this point GT type just a few built-in traits, which are Rust reusable pieces of functionality that we can, will enable this partial ordering that we wanted to use down beneath. I won't talk too much into this. The derived macro is an incredibly powerful tool, and there's many fantastic resources to learn more about it. It's part of the Rust language rather than something that's unique to PyO3. So now that we've done that, our Rust code should all be in place for us to do this and play with something that really is now finally equivalent to our original data class. We've written a bit more Rust code this time, but I hope that it's something that could be reduced over time. So for one final round, let's bring up IPython. And we can import the two different point 2D types. Uh, and first, let's play around with this point 2D from Rust. And this time, we can see that it has a nice representation, which we uh, delivered. And also, if we do some kind of comparison with it, we should expect to have a success. Great, everything's working as expected. And if we were to create a, a NAN, that's a very interesting result. I'm not quite sure how I've managed to achieve that. I've defied my own safety check. I'll have to figure out what's going on after the talk. Perhaps that can be something for the Zoom breakout call. Um, anyway, so let's move on to just a final interesting thing, which let's generate a large list of these and figure out how long it takes to sort these two sets of numbers if we generate using our Python data class and also our Rust data class. Uh, so we're going to use Python's built-in random number generation to achieve this and make some points. So we will just create a list of these, which has both random X and Y coordinates. And we'll make maybe 10,000 is a good amount to have a sense of size. And then we can use the Python function sorted to see how long it takes to sort these. And we get a number out seven milliseconds thereabouts. Let's do the same thing with Python number instead. So that should be the equivalent construction. And now if we do the Python, the sorting, well, no guesses. It's, well, it's slightly more than three X slower, actually. It's got 25 milliseconds instead of seven milliseconds. But the point still holds really well. We've changed Python code for very, very equivalent Rust code and ended up with a three X speed up. So in this case, there's been a little bit more boilerplate than for the function, but I think it's still showing that in general, you can do this again and again and again and continue to get at least a 3x speed up. And if you want to push maybe with Rust, you could implement your own sort function that would be multi-threaded. You could push this multiplier higher and higher again too. That's where I'm going to leave the live demonstration and come over to a conclusion. So there's really just three takeaways that I'd like you to have from this talk today. The first one is that it's easy to get started with the Pi 3. I hope I've convinced you of that by demonstrating it in the terminal in front of you. Uh, there's a good rule of thumb, which is that if you replace some Python code with Rust, you'll end up with something that's about 3x faster. And this, obviously, you can push further and further with extra work. But what I'm really talking about is if you do the dumbest, simplest translation of Python code to Rust code you can, you'll end up, hopefully, with something that's going to give you that 3x for more or less free. And then finally, we're a really open community that's developing this Pi 3 project. And if you find this work interesting or also want to help build it, then please do come and communicate on the Pi 3 GitHub. It's through community or I guess community enthusiasm that this project even exists. And I really hope that it can be something that can carry forward into the future. 
Uh, as a little bonus to maybe whet your appetite if you're interested in contributing, this is what I hope our sample Rust code that we just wrote might look like in the future of PyO3. So instead of having that Py module proc macro on top of a function, we've got it on top of a Rust module. And then for this Py class proc macro, we're just going to have extra annotations, data class and ordered to tell PyO3 to go away and generate all of that boilerplate that we just had to type out manually. So we haven't come around to implementing these yet in PyO3, but I don't really see a reason why we couldn't have that in the future. And that's it. Thank you very much for your, spending your time today listening to me ramble. All right. I think we're back. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah that was really, really good. Um, yeah, if, if, if everyone in the chat, if, if you want to ask any questions, um, go for it. Uh, we'll try and pick through some of them. Jamie, I think you've got the you've got the wheel effectively with the questions. So, um, yeah, I'll yeah. start putting up on screen now. Uh, mm -hmm. Start with that one then. OK, uh, so we've got from I, I think it must be Jara. Uh, for the sorted case, was the speed up just from the basic comparison operators being faster? Uh, yeah, essentially. So uh, I spoke about Python's dynamic typing. And in both the cases of the data class or the Rust class that we implemented, uh, Python's going to have to use that sorted algorithm and then figure out what the comparison operator implemented is. And either it finds it as the Python code for that data class or it finds the Rust implemented ordering operator. And then, so yeah, it's that ordering operator really that's being 3x faster, which is producing that speed up. Uh, from Matty, uh, somewhere it was mentioned that you plan to generate function signatures automatically with that attempt to make type annotations too. I realize this sounds quite hard. Um, yeah, so. I really, really um, want that to be the case. Uh, I don't know if you've used the PyBind 11 library, which is what C++, uh, I guess it's the, the most leading C++ implementation of doing this kind of stuff. And in that case, if you write a C++ function and then wrap it in the appropriate bindings for C++, you can end up with something that automatically has the type annotations written into the doc string. Um, and that's quite a convenient way to do it, but it's also not the best way for, say, IDEs, which are looking for standalone type annotations in these PyI files. Uh, so I think there's sort of two stages there. It'd be really great for us to emit as much like, information as possible onto the, the object itself, so that when you're looking at it from a Python interpreter and you can do things like help to interactively like, explore these objects, we might get some of this type information out. But yeah, I think in the long run, we probably would need to rely on a tool like Maturin to automatically do like a translation pass and generate these type of annotations. And I think that if we can get to that stage, that would be incredibly powerful. I think that's realistically still some way off in the PyO3 project's journey. But if you're interested in making that happen, please do help us make it happen. I think this one was partially answered in the chat, but I don't know if you've got anything you want to add to it. Uh, yeah, OK. So Py3 takes the Rust code and turns it into some sort of C thing. Uh, how does the Py3 timing compare to the C equivalent? Uh, that makes sense. Uh, so there's, I would say that if you wrote the same thing in C, you'll find that you have to type, first off, a lot more code because you're writing pretty much the like low level structures instead of the high level stuff that PyO3 is offering you in that Rust syntax. Um, but what you'll then find in terms of the performance, which is what you're really asking there, I think that you would find because you're end up handwriting the C, you'll probably get something which is uh, possibly even slightly faster than what PyO3 gets because you haven't had to go through all of the like, automatic boilerplate that PyO3 has written. You know, it's a continual challenge the PyO3 project to make that generated code as optimal as possible. But I think there's always realistically going to be like some overhead cost associated with this. We get better and better as time goes on. Um, so you'll probably end up with something that's even faster. But the trade-off is that you've had to work directly in C, and I think you're at much more risk of the kinds of bugs that Rust is preventing you from doing. So yeah, you can get faster, but it's not really the only motivation of PyO3. It's also the safety that Rust provides.
how did the switch from Python to Rust during your career feel? Um, so I, this is an interesting one. For me, I, uh, I actually still work with Python. It's a great language, and I think that there are many things that I will continue to use it for, because uh, just the other day, for example, I was looking for a particular security library, which turned out that Rust wasn't quite ready to offer a stable package for me to use yet, whereas Python had one that was maybe five years old already, and there was absolutely no reason that I was going to implement this myself rather than use Python. Um, in terms of the learning curve, for myself, it's a little bit unfair to kind of assess that only because uh, when I was much younger, I had the, the crazy idea that I was going to teach myself C++ development. Um, <laughs> I don't know, you might actually be able to see down on my bottom shelf a couple of C++ books. Um, and that was actually where I was learning before I switched to Rust. And uh, I think that gave me a really good grounding uh, in how, I guess, Rust wants you to think about like memory allocation and things like that. Without that, maybe there's a little bit of overhead that you'll kind of have to go through. So I think I'm probably not the best person to talk about that stepping directly from Python to Rust story. Um, but at the same time, like uh, the Rust learning materials are very, very good. You can write high level algorithms in Rust in much the same way that you can in Python. So the only real hurdle that I've kind of seen from other Python programmers who I've kind of coached to write more Rust is in particular getting your idea around this sort of memory model that's a bit closer to the actual computer hardware than Python is. Thank Could you explain one. Sorry. how the memory used by the Rust class is instantiated Python is three? Sure. So the Python, you may be aware, is a garbage collected language and it's also reference counted. And so that means that when we create, say, our Python data class, then what's actually going on there is that there's three objects that have been created, say, there's the point 2D thing itself, and then we've got the underlying two numbers, which are also Python objects. And all of these are carrying their own reference counts. And so when we eventually stop using these objects, they become unreachable from our code, their reference count falls to zero, and the Python memory or garbage collector will clean these up. And it's much the same way. How we do about it in PyO3 is that when you try and construct one of these point 2D types, say, for written from Rust instead of from Python, then the Python code calling us gives us the opportunity to make some allocation that Python then owns, and it's reference counted in exactly the same way. So there's a block of memory, but the difference being that instead of there being three objects, there's just one because the integer or the floating point numbers are stored inside that same block because we've written Rust code rather than Python code. And then when that whole block no longer is referenced, that's going to just get allocated in one shot. So it works very, very similarly to the Python garbage collection that you've already seen, but there's maybe just some slight optimizations under the hood because it's Rust. I think there's one final question from Ellis. Where am I looking? Yeah, I think right at the bottom of the. Oh no, sorry, that's not a question. Uh, Seven fifty-six on the times. Uh... Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think that's the final one I saw in the chat. Is there any work happening on integrating Pi3 with alternative Python JITs such as number or piston? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I haven't really had much experience of trying to wrestle with those JITs. When I first tried number, it was a long, long time ago, and it actually didn't quite offer me what I was looking for at the time. Uh, I'd have to go and learn more about how they interact with uh, C extensions to get an idea of is this is something that was technically possible. Uh, for PyPy, for example, it has a lot of internal optimizations that it's making. Obviously, it's doing just in, in, in time optimizations all the time to the Python code that's running. So if you interact with Py3 from PyPy, we've made it possible. But uh, PyPy kind of has to de-optimize itself at the boundary between you and its own optimized code. And so, sure, I mean, PyPy can work very hard to make that efficient, but there's no real, like, you know, there's no JIT optimization of the Rust code. That is compiled and that stays compiled. Um, 
So I would imagine that an integration with something like Number would probably be very similar, but I'd really be curious to go and have a read about that. Cool. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, right? I think we're good. Um, all right, so um, as David mentioned, we're, we're gonna hop over on onto Zoom, uh, which I will go and post a link to now. So uh, let me go and do that. Uh, hey, there should be a Zoom link in chat as of about now. Um, so we will hop over there. Um, if you wanna join us and have a chat, then yeah, let's uh, let's go for it. But um, thank you very much again, David. Really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, I hope that some of you are now feeling inspired to join me on the uh, Rust and Python journey. All right, let's cool. go. Let's hop over to Zoom. Cheers.